All right, it's just about that time. Welcome everyone. Before we get started, we have just a few housekeeping logistic items. I'm your host, Sam Wins, and this is our talk, our next talk on our Naturally Speaking series, Successful Pollination, Factors that Influence the Plants and Pollinators of Coastal Southern and Baja California with Dr. Sula Vanderplank. So this talk is in a webinar format. Um, you're not gonna be able to see other participants, only the hosts and the panelists, right? So to please ask questions, uh, use the Q&A function on the menu bar, either at the bottom or at the top of your Zoom screen, depending on what version you have. Um, the Q&A is wonderful. It'll um, queue them up in the order they were received. And then I will go ahead and um, ask Sula those questions when it comes time. Right. There are a lot of us here tonight, so please keep your mic muted uh, in order to prevent that cross traffic that we all hate. Um, if you must unmute to ask a question, please wait for the Q&A at the end. And captions are available for tonight's talk uh, thanks to our captionist, Carol. Thank you, Carol. Um, and sponsorship from the Cabrillo National Monument Foundation. Um, if you are interested in seeing these captions, you can click on the CC at the bottom or the top of your screen. You can also choose to read a transcript. Um, and speaking of the sponsors, Cabrillo National Management Foundation, of course, sponsor this whole event as they have been this whole Naturally Speaking series uh, throughout the summer. So big thanks once again to them. Okay, so now that we're done with those housekeeping items, let's get to that main event. It's my great pleasure to introduce tonight's guest speaker, Dr. Sula Vanderplank. Sula is a biodiversity explorer, which again, I think is the coolest title ever, and rare plant botanist who specializes in the vegetation of Northwestern Mexico and Southern California. She's worked for organizations such as the UC Institute for Mexico in the US or UC Mexis, the Botan Botanical Research Institute of Texas, the San Diego Natural History Museum, and is the current director of terrestrial ecosystem conservation at Pro Natura Noroeste, a Mexican nonprofit organization. Sula is also an award-winning speaker, an advocate for conversation, uh, conservation and conversation, um, and, you know, on the side, a boat captain. You know, just to throw that in there. So without further ado, I give you Dr. Sula Vanderplank. Take it away, Sula. Let me stop sharing here. There you go. Thank you so much, Sam. I really appreciate it. I'm, I'm honored to be part of Pollinate the Palooza. And um, Sam, you always find a way to, to push me a little further and get me to do something more, something I didn't know I could do. And I have to say, when you asked me to give a talk on pollination, I thought, can I do this? can I do this but I'm excited to talk to you guys about a subject that's you know something I'm very interested in but not a specialist in uh, but something I've been thinking about for the last few years and so I hope I hope you guys will enjoy this and thank you for the lovely introduction <laughs> I'm going to try and share my screen now okay are you seeing my screen great well, as I mentioned, this talk is a little new to me, so I hope you'll bear with me. But what I really want to talk about is some of the factors we perhaps don't think about when we think about pollination and the different things that might affect the success of pollination and how and when pollination happens. So this is a pretty theoretical talk, um, but I'll start from the, the beginning and let's just go over what pollination is right from the very beginning. So let's see if I can get this next slide going. So pollination obviously is basically the transfer of the pollen, the, the male gametes to the receptive stigma of the female down into the, the um, ovules and the ovaries of the plant to make a fruit and a seed. So it's one of the plant's main goals in life. Really plants are trying to do two things. They're trying to get pollinated and then they're trying to get those seeds into the right place. And these are their two main functions and the whole purpose of flowers is to ensure pollination. So there's two kinds of pollination, self-pollination. On the left here, we're seeing a yellow flower um, with some little brown X's that are pollen grains coming from red stamens towards that green central stigma and ovary. And on the right with the pink and blue flowers, we're seeing the transfer of pollen between flowers, which is cross-pollination. 
Throughout most of the talk, I'm going to be very generally speaking about cross-pollination and plants moving pollen between flowers. Um, but self-pollination does exist and is another kind of pollination. And, and if any of this is not straightforward, please do um, pop something in the q and I'm happy to be stopped at any time on, on some of these concepts. But so there's different kinds of pollination. A lot of our ancestral plants are, of course, wind pollinated. So moving your pollen by means of wind actually requires a huge amount of pollen to ensure that enough pollen reaches its intended destination. So you look at this cloud of pollen, think about the trees that so many of us are allergic to. You think about your pines and your oaks, think about all your grasses, all grasses are wind pollinated. A lot of species still do all their pollination by wind. And another fairly ancestral trait, although now with some very modern sort of evolutionary twists, is underwater pollination and water uh, pollination through water, the movement of pollen and gametes through water. And so the upper picture here on the right hand side is showing you a series of forked stigmas. Um, so the female flowers in the water waiting to receive pollen in the water column and certain seagrasses. So this is one of our uh, seagrasses off the coast of Calif Southern California here will pulse the release of pollen into the tides and that pollen can be carried through on certain currents and pollinate underwater. Other plants like the one below um, is actually a plant you can you can see little um, anthers pollen anthers leaving a protective case and they're sent up on a stalk all the way to the surface where pollination occurs at the surface either by uh, the pollen floating across the surface or by a small animal or a vector moving that pollen at the surface. But there's a lot of different ways to achieve pollination. However, most of the time and most of our sort of focus and interest tends to be uh, focused on vector pollination. And again, most of what I'll be talking about today is what we call vector pollination. So that's using some kind of insect, animal, bee, something to help move that pollen from one flower to another. Okay, so I'm talking very general theory tonight, mostly going to be cross pollination with vectors. In the, the example you're seeing here, there's a bee taking pollen from one flower and putting it onto the stigma of another flower. Um, often we call this insect pollination, but, but really the, the correct term is vector pollination because a lot of things that aren't insects can also affect pollination. And we'll talk about that a little more in just a second. Um, one thing just to think about a lot of plants will prevent self-pollination and so they will have um, their pollen ripen at a time when their stigma is not receptive and vice versa their stigma will be receptive when they do not have ripe pollen this is a way to avoid pollinating themselves for many species self-pollination is not beneficial in general but these are very general principles but in general the goal is to get your pollen to another plant and to get pollen from another plant so Thinking about these general principles, we're gonna talk a lot tonight about really which factors affect the ability of vectors to move pollen and which factors affect how far they travel and how successful they are. So that's, I, I kind of want us to think theoretically about some of these things uh, tonight and I hope you'll have fun with that with me. So here's an example, uh, just sort of a, a, a real example with photos now. This is a uh, um, island morning glory out here on San Clemente Island. You can see a huge number of flowers and you can see these small native bees moving from flower to flower, moving the pollen from one plant to the next. Now that's not to say that they're not actually moving pollen from 10, 15, 20 different flowers onto another flower. Once they get that good mix of pollen all over them, you're getting really good genetic exchange, good genetic transfer, assuming this isn't all one large plant. So there's other considerations in here too. Um, this may well be just one large plant and that pollen may be self-pollination self crossing between flowers, but within the same individual. So other considerations here, do you want to only have one flower at a time as a plant or do you put out as many flowers as you can in the hope that there's another plant nearby and that those vectors are traveling? Okay. So as I mentioned, a lot of different things can be vectors. And so that's why I'm gonna use the word vectors, not insects. Um, Cause especially here in Southern California, as you know, we have a lot of hummingbirds that move things around. We have a lot of hummingbird hawk moths. Bats are also really important pollinators for us. In other parts of the world, small mammals um, are also really significant pollinators, sometimes the only pollinators of large plants. And even here in Southern California, sometimes mice and other small mammals will climb up into the inflorescences of things like agaves. 
Um, so we do have a huge variety of different vectors that can move things. But there's a catch to this because there's a lot of things that are also visiting those flowers and not pollinating. And so another, another term you'll hear used a lot is floral visitors. Visitors to flowers, who's visiting the flowers and who's actually pollinating the flowers are often two very different things. Is everyone with me so far? So this is just a, a visual to show you um, a little bit about what, what's happening, all the ecological interactions happening within a single flower. So the flower itself is attracting a multitude of vectors through its color, through its shape, through its scent, through the production of nectar. And pollen itself is a really important source of protein. Pollen is very nutritious. And so a lot of insects are actively looking to eat the pollen and collect the pollen, <laughs> not just move it around as a byproduct of what they happen to be doing. On top of that, you've got a lot of other, um, in this case, mostly insects in this diagram, but other vectors coming perhaps to feed on some of the, uh, the vectors that are visiting the flowers, perhaps to feed on each other, perhaps they've come to pollinate, perhaps they've come for the nectar, perhaps they've just come to chew the petals, perhaps they've come to eat away the anthers. They're not always friends. So as much as the flowers are there to attract the correct vectors, they often attract a host of additional vectors who frankly are not there to help at all. And so this is one of the, the really big ecological trade-offs that we're dealing with. Um, the more you attract different vectors and different visitors to your flowers, yes, your chances of pollination are higher, but your chances of predation and damage and loss are also higher. So if you, you there's lots and lots of different ways the plants approach this. One way is to have flowers that open for a very short time. You open in the morning, you attract all the pollinators that you can in the first few hours of the day, you close your flowers before those um, internal reproductive organs can be eaten. So a lot of times those floral predators, once they come and they get inside the flower, they can get right down into the ovary, they can eat the seeds, they can eat the anthers away, they can do a lot of damage. And the whole purpose of the flower is to produce the seeds, right? It's to get the pollen, it's to, to get the genetic cross, and it's to produce the fruits. So this is a really important balancing act for, for most plants. Um, and then different things factor in here. And so this is, <laughs> this is the part that's fascinated me how does this balance point differ in different environmental conditions, different climatic conditions? What happens and how does it shift this balance? And so that's what I kind of wanted us all to think about today. And um, I don't know if this is a good point to take a quick break, Sam, and make sure everyone's on board with, are there any questions or? Sure, absolutely. We do have one question in the Q&A. Um, and I love this question because it really demonstrates to me that they're thinking deeply about the topic that you've introduced to them. So uh, the question is, how do plants prevent pollination of incompatible pollen from different species? So can different species come in and pollinate these plants, in other words? Um, and if so, how do they prevent it? That's a great question. So the majority of that happens at the stigmatic surface. The surface itself is, is almost a, an intelligent film. It's an intelligent receptive surface, and it only lets in, if you like, certain pollen grains. So um, at a molecular level, it can identify pollen grains of the same species. Now, some closely related species can get through and they can have a pollen grain that germinates into the stigma, but often there's also then a morphological mismatch. So my pollen might germinate and we send down what's called a pollen tube. And the tube travels actually right down the stigma into the ovary. Pollen from a different species might have a very short pollen tube and you might have a very long stigma. So there's lots of different ways that the plant can stop uh, pollen from the wrong plant reaching the ovary. And it can also then be rejected all the way down at the ovary. So, there's multiple ways that the plant can identify and reject the pollen. The vast majority happens at that stigmatic surface where the pollen will either germinate and die on the surface, the pollen tube won't uh, penetrate. Um, don't forget the pollen's alive, you know, and the stigmatic surface is, is alive. So it really is the meeting of two live organisms identifying each other and saying, mm, I can't live here. <laughs> You're not welcome here, you know. And so most of that's happening when the pollen reaches the plant. 
Um, but some some do get through and obviously hybrids in nature do exist and mm. that is exactly what happens the wrong pollen lands and makes its way through that's interesting so there's lots of safeguards but sometimes those all of those safeguards fail when you get those hybrids very fascinating right. um, remember folks to type your questions for sula in the q a and we'll stop periodically to answer them um, but sula i think you're good to go to continue from here thank you Okay, so I want to show you some examples of floral predation, nectar robbers, flower robbers, um, some of these different types of damage. So you can see here insects boring holes into the outside of flowers. You'll recognize these as um, manzanita flowers. And you can see the holes being bored in the side. So this damage to the petals also it might just seem like, oh, damaged flower, but that can be very off-putting to the correct pollinator too. Uh, the correct pollinator for a lot of species will very strongly identify certain floral shapes and floral forms. And so damage to the structures can also be a real problem. But if you look at the, the picture on the right, what we're seeing is a sort of pendulous clump of buds and open flowers. And you can see here one of the buds where the little um, yellow arrow is pointing. You can see that an insect came in and ate the whole middle. So all that protein rich, the anthers, the early pollen, the reproductive structures, <laughs> all the important parts of the flower have been completely eaten away before it ever opened. Um, so this is a, the kind of thing that plants are trying to avoid in terms of avoiding predation at that level. But interestingly, if you attract enough predators um, of florivores, as they're called, so animals that eat flowers, if you attract enough vectors that eat flowers, you will then attract other species who have come to feed on your pests. And so I, I really enjoy these pictures where you can see two crab spiders. They're, they're actually quite hard to see, but they're both yellow and they're both on a, the background, which is a yellow flower. So we're seeing yellow, I think in this case, brassica flowers with yellow crab spiders hiding in the flowers and eating the things that have come to eat the flowers. And so in, on the left, that's um, looks like some kind of wasp. And on the right, it's a caterpillar. Um, but so you've got a whole ecosystem developing around this, who are you attracting, and then that's attracting, you know, people you, the, well, vectors you want, vectors you don't want, and that's attracting other vectors that are coming in to eat the, you know, there's a lot going on <laughs> in these flowers at any given time. And there is like, a real, really a whole ecosystem around this. And so you've probably heard of examples like these symbiosis with ants, where plants can attract ants. Um, and ants can patrol up and down the stems and remove the unwanted insects and keep things away from damaging flowers. I've put up a, an example here that I find really interesting, which is these are what we call extra floral nectaries. By extra floral, we just mean that they're away from the flowers. So these cacti have nectaries on the cactus itself. So in the picture on the right, you're seeing a, a large orange ant in the middle on a cactus pad. And there's some blobs. I wonder if you can see my mouse. Can you see my mouse? This is actually a nectary. It's a nectar producing bud at the base of a spine cluster on a barrel cactus. And the ants are coming here to feed and they're taking that nectar as a reward. In this case, they're probably protecting the fruits and the fruit development. And they're probably protecting the cactus from attack on the seeds, not the flowers. But that same, that same principle, and you'll see in a minute, a lot of the same principles with the production and dispersion of seeds are actually very similar to the pollination process. It's another time that you've got to move something and you've got to protect something and you can engage sort of partners and other predators in nature. So um, engaging different predators like ants is also a different way to get around this. And so the second thing that plants are really trying to do apart from pollinate themselves is then disperse those seeds. And so I wanted to just touch briefly on that too. How do plants move their seeds? How are seeds moved? Lots of different ways, obviously. One really important way is through granivory or the eating of the grains, the eating of the acorns. You can see here um, a squirrel in the top left. You can see a woodpecker in the top right eating acorns. And below here, you're seeing some different seeds with burrs and things that attach to fur and human clothing, <laughs> um, and things that will stick onto other things and move around. Um, but in general, there are four different ways that plants move their seeds. Very similar to the pollination here. And you'll see one, one of the primary ways is wind, wind blown. Um, also, you're seeing on the right hand side water. Another way is being transferred by water. And actually, there are some instances of seeds being dispersed by fish. But that's a story for another day. The use of animals as vectors, just like in the case of pollination. But in seed dispersal, we have a fourth way 
and that is expulsion. So some of these seeds have that ability to spring and fling, fling their fling their seeds mechanically into space. But I think it's interesting to think about how similar the mechanisms are and how similar some of the processes are. The same um, forces behind pollination and distribution. But coming back to sort of pollination and phenology, phenology um, is a word we use basically to mean the timing of life cycle events. It's not synonymous with flowering. It really is the timing of the setting of buds, the timing of flowering, the timing of the flowers getting old, the timing of fruit forming, the timing of leaves forming and perhaps dying. In the case of annual plants, it's the, the timing of those plants living and dying. So basically trying to understand the timing of the plants. And so a really important point I want to come back to here is timing is everything in terms of how many vectors you're attracting. Are you gonna be able to do everything at the same time as all your neighbors? Are you gonna be able to produce your flowers at the same time as all the neighboring plants have flowers? Are you gonna be able to bring in huge numbers of insects by having what we call a very synchronous bloom? Or, you know, timing is, is crucial here. And so really what I want to talk about a little bit of is about a project that I did to try and understand how the timing, how the phenology of these plants affects some of that pollination and predation success and what that means then for the transfer of that pollen, the distance that pollen is transferred and the genetic outcomes. So just an example of phenology here. So this is um, the Baja California buckeye. It's a gorgeous treelet, small tree. <laughs> um, this is one of those species that responds to local moisture availability. So it will put out its leaves in the spring as soon as it's got enough water and it's ready it'll put out flowers you can see the top right hand picture just shows it in full leaf the bottom right hand picture shows you it's actually flowering and in leaf at the same time and the main picture here on the left shows you the leaves have all been dropped and but it's still flowering and in fruit so this plant in particular has a lot of different phenologies and doesn't always have leaves when it has flowers or have fruits when it has leaves, or it can do very different things. And it can vary the phenology of its leaves, its flowers, its fruits, timing wise, and also in terms of their coordination. So a lot of plants have what we call canalized development, which means that they can only do things in a set sequence. And once they start, they're doing them and it's often a very rigid timeline. So for example, a plant might start to make a flower. Once it's started, it's gonna be 30 days until that flower produces um, a fruit. And then it's gonna be another 15 days until the seeds ripen. And then it's gonna be 15 days until seed release. You know, and often that's a very um, strictly sort of timed process from start to finish. And so once they start, they keep going. Um, this is a plant that's a lot more plastic in its response. So it's able to just adjust, oh, you know, it's stopped draining, I'm gonna drop some leaves, I'm gonna hold on to my fruits a little longer, I'm gonna flower for a little longer. I'm, you know, and so this idea of plasticity varies enormously between species. And so one thing is plasticity in, in the starting point. A lot of plants can adjust when they start to flower. They can wait if it's cool, they'll wait, they'll wait a long time. As soon as it warms up, they might start to flower. But once they start, the timing of what happens next is, is canalized, as we call it. It's basically going through a canal. It's, it's a one way street and you can't stop it and you can't adjust it. So it's interesting to look at species like these that are much more plastic in their ability to do different things on the landscape. And when we look at phenology, when we look at, you know, in particular flowering times, we're really looking at three very different factors. So the first one is onset, the beginning. When do they start flowering? The second we're looking at is this idea of synchrony. Do they all flower at once? And the third thing we're looking at is how long do they flower for? You can very quickly see each of these three things is enormously significant for attracting pollinators. When are you going to flower? Are you going to flower at the same time as everybody else? And for how long are you going to do so? Right. And so these these are the ecological considerations um, that really <laughs> have been fascinating me ever since my my doctoral work in Baja California, which I'm going to talk to you a little bit about today. Sam, do we need to pause for questions? What do you think? I think this is a lovely time to pause for questions. Um, 
So we do have a question back to the predatory insects. So those crabs, mm -hmm. I believe. Um, so someone would like to know if the color of the predatory insects are derived from the plant's flower. Can you uh, explain that process a little bit? I wish I knew the answer. So I, I feel fairly confident that this is a very deliberate camouflage on the part of those insects where they have found a way to blend in well and be able to hide in those flowers and leaf out on their prey. I do not know whether the color itself is derived from eating the pigments in the plants. I'm sure it's possible, but I'm really sorry that it's outside my knowledge base. Yeah, that was kind of a tricky question. I think, and there could be a variety of answers, right? It could just be natural selection, right? Over time, it became more and more, that species became more and more like the color of the flowers that it liked to hide on uh, because that was made it better to survive, right? And be a fitter individual, or it could be that, you know, eating the pigments, right? Um, so this is whoever this anonymous attendee is that asked the question, this is your, your homework for the evening to look up crab spiders and to see if you can figure out um, how they become that yellow color of the yellow flower that they like to hide on. And let uh, us know. <laughs> yeah, and please let us know, indeed. Um, and then we do have another question, uh, Sula. So do plants interfere with each other's pollination events via a liloth a li oh gosh, it's allele, but Allelopathy. <laughs> Allelopathy. Oh my goodness, that is a tongue twister. Allelopathy. Hmm. Can you? That is a, a really great yeah. question. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So allelopathy is is generally considered that concept of where plants. I'm going to oversimplify, but basically, send out toxins, hormones, chemicals to keep other plants away, and so it's the process by which plants become very well spaced in nature um, by by putting out basically chemicals that will stop other plants from invading that space. So it's a fascinating question. Are the plants actually interfering with the pollination of others? This is the where I'm sorry that it's not genuinely my specialty and I don't <laughs> know the answers to some of these questions. But one thing I do know is that the insects themselves, the vectors themselves, insects in particular, will often put out different hormones and affect it. I'm not sure there's any evidence of the flowers doing that from their side, but from the other side, the insects certainly will put out pheromones, will communicate to other insects. Okay, I found the honey pot, I found the flower field, everyone else should come over here. And so there are certainly hormonal communications and controls that are affecting the pollination process. And I would say in particular, that's gonna be, you know, finding things early on, who's first to flower and finding those in a scarce environment, but also um, related to synchrony. So if you find a patch where there's a lot of flowers in a small area, that's likely to create the swarming and bring in lots of different insects and they can send a lot of chemical signals themselves. Mm. Um, I wish I, it's a fascinating question whether or not the, the yeah. plants are actually, but I think, so within, within a species, you wouldn't want to affect anyone else's pollination because you want someone else's pollen and you want them to get yours. So within your species, where I don't think it would make evolutionary sense for plants to have an allelopathic effect mm -hmm. within themselves but whether or not this one with other species whether or not you're sort of sending out something to try and <laughs> stunt the development of other species nearby I mean it wouldn't surprise me I feel like one of the cutting edges um, of, of natural history in particular is that we're really starting to realize just how much biotic interactions are influencing everything and we just didn't know the importance of things like nurse plant effects, the importance of things like mycorrhizae in the soil. There are so many interactions we're unaware of. I'm not aware of that interaction, but I, that certainly doesn't mean it doesn't exist. That's awesome. Oh my gosh, so many great research questions, right? Uh, <laughs> to the, thank you for everyone for giving us our research <laughs> questions here. Um, uh, so I, we have a hypothesis actually about those crab spiders or, or other predators uh, that wait on flowers. Um, someone thinks that it could be chromophores that are responsible for the insect color. Wow. I know. Yeah, see, I love it. We've got a bunch of deep thinkers here tonight. Keep those hypotheses coming. That's awesome. Um, if you have a thought about that, feel free to interject, uh, Sula. Um, I know. I wish I knew more. I'm fascinated. Thank you. Yeah, exactly. 
Um, and then Jose would like to know, can you give examples of MSS or CSS plants, which use, here's this tongue twister for me again, allelopathy, allelopathy, I'm going to get this, allelopathy, <laughs> I think you get it, to prevent flower predation. Let me read that again. Can you give examples of MSS or CSS plants, which use allelopathy to prevent flower predation? So I'm assuming by MSS, you mean maritime succulent scrub and by CSS, you mean coastal sage scrub, just um, uh, for the question. So the best best known examples come from the deserts. Um, and often the way desert plants are spaced, those are some of the most famous examples. And off the top of my head, I don't know of good examples from those two habitats that you mentioned for allelopathy. We are going to talk about some of those plants and their pollinator syndromes and their behavior in response to weather in just a second. I don't, I will, I will, I will try to think and come back to your question, but off the top of my head, I cannot think of an allelopathic response in, in our sort of Cabrillo National Monument habitats. I'd have um, because in, in, in all honesty, it's usually something where resources are so scarce that it's worth you generating an enormous amount, um, well, putting an enormous amount of energy into generating something toxic to keep others away. So it tends to occur more in very resource scarce habitats. Hmm. And so I don't think it's as common in our fairly rich coastal plains. <laughs> um, but again, we're way out of my depth now, and it's fascinating. <laughs> it's so nice to, to sort of swim in the unknown waters. But yeah, it's yeah, we're, we're, we're on the very edge of anything I know now. <laughs> well, now that I've thrown you some really hardball questions here, Sula, let's, why don't you go ahead and move forward with what you have to say? Thank you. OK, so we're looking here at a, a, you know, a big field of sunflowers. And this, to me, is the perfect example of floral synchrony. So when I talk about synchrony, this, that sort of super bloom, that yellow carpet, that the whole landscape's gone one color, that density of plants, that's really what I'm talking about when we talk about the synchronicity and, or, of, the, of the flowering. So this is the crux of that trade-off. That synchronous bloom attracts tons of vectors. So your pollination success should be really high, but your predation is really high too. And the other problem here is that the distance that your vectors are moving is probably not very far. So if I have a landscape this dense in yellow flowers and I'm a small insect vector, I can spend all day in a very small area and, and get my needs. So that pollen transfer may not be very far at all. And so this is, this is one of the, the important things I sort of want to comment on. This idea of whether synchronicity of flowering is, is a good thing or a bad thing, um, it is a very interesting ecological trade-off. So think about our high rainfall years, our El Nino years, where we have this boom and we sort of have this synchronicity across all of our landscapes and our annual plants. That's a year where probably there's a ton of plants getting pollinated, a ton of vectors coming in, but that distance traveled might be quite short. That genetic exchange might be short. Um, and the other side to this is in those low rainfall years when just a few flowers come up, maybe they're a lot better spaced on the landscape, maybe there's a lot better genetic exchange, maybe our genes are moving a lot further across the landscape, our vectors are traveling further to find the flowers. Does this make sense? Is everyone with me? Okay, <clears throat> excuse me. So um, th there's a lot of climatic drivers to whether or not that flowering is synchronous and what's going on. And so you'll, you'll never look at the landscape the same again now. <laughs> but you know, this idea of, of what's happening and how important is it that everything's flowering at once or not in terms of the genetic composition and diversity of the landscape. So I don't want to go into a lot of detail about the genetics, but suffice to say, if you only have very synchronous blooms in a very fragmented landscape, you will eventually get a genetic bottleneck because you won't be getting any outcrossing. And so one of the, the problems that we're facing in our modern society with our very fragmented habitats and landscapes is this separation of, even in a great synchronous bloom, if I only ever cross pollinate with my neighbors, at some point, my genetic pool is depleted and continues to lower. So synchronicity in and of itself is a fascinating sort of ecological conundrum. 
And I do, I do want to say a little bit about some of the species from our local habitats. And so we talked about succulent coastal scrub or maritime succulent scrub, um, Matheral costero rosetophilo, which is my favorite habitat in the whole world. And you can see here a beautiful picture of a coastal plain. What I love about this natural garden is that you can see succulent plants, rosette forming plants, evergreen plants, drought deciduous plants, annuals, geophytes that form bulbs and just you know, come up in the spring, there's a whole mixture of life forms. Very different from a sort of chaparral where plants tend to be the same height and they tend to all have thick leaves and they all have deep roots and they're very similar in their sort of design and composition. But very different life forms and a very rich habitat here on the coast. So what happens with the phenologies somewhere this diverse, where plants are so different? Excuse me, I'm losing my voice. <laughs> So another really important thing about this habitat is how dry it is in summer. So if you compare that previous picture from the spring where everything's green and flowering, this is what that same habitat looks like in summer when it's very dry. And this should be familiar to you. These are the same habitats that we have at Cabrillo National Monument. One very, very important factor in our landscapes that's generally very overlooked is the presence of coastal fogs. We are very fortunate to have our cold California current and in summer in particular with cold water, cold water upwelling along the side of the coast and hot sun above, it forms this blanket or fog. Now it doesn't particularly matter if it's a low fog or a cloud layer or a cloudy day, anything low cloud and fog has an enormous effect on plant communities. And so I want to get into this a little bit more, but my research question was really, how does the fog affect the flowering times? And what does that then mean for the rest of the ecosystem? So that's kind of the crux of what I wanted us to talk about today. So I'm just gonna give you a little bit of um, information, a few insights from some of my doctoral work. And I'll, I wanna go through these fairly quickly, but I just wanna give you some sense of the work that I did so you understand the kind of results that we're talking about. But I had weather stations set up in Baja, California, basically from Ensenada down to San Quintin. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me, in the top right corner, you can see here a little overview map of the peninsula and a red square that shows you the area I was working at. So it's really just south of the border, just in an hour and a half south of San Diego, down to about, I want to say five hours south in San Quintin. It's a very steep rainfall gradient through that area. So I wanted specifically to look at the same plants that we have at Cabrillo National Monument, our same ecosystems, but across a climate gradient. So for each of these, I installed a weather station and used a whole kilometer as my sort of giant super transect. Because I really don't want little localized weather patterns. I don't want the difference from one slope to the next. I don't want, you know, this was a small dip in the soil. I'm looking at a landscape scale and I'm trying to understand at a landscape scale. So very large monitoring sites across that landscape. For each of these weather stations, I'm looking at very basic things, temperature, relative humidity, which is a proxy for fog, rainfall, and then leaf wetness. Um, which is also a proxy for fog. So I was able to detect some, some different fog measures. And then I also looked at soil moisture to see how much of that moisture gets into the soil. <coughs> Excuse me. Do we have new questions, Sam, or am I, am I just seeing the old questions? Um, we do have, one new question, but I think we can go ahead and continue and we can address that question later unless you would like to. Okay. <clears throat> no, that's great. So this is like a landscape look at that, the habitat from one of my study sites. And you can see here, I'm trying to understand the phenology of the shrubs, of the succulents, of the annuals, and put this all together across the landscape. And, and this is a good example of the synchronicity too. Some plants in this picture are flowering very synchronously. There's a golden shrub, which is probably a California sunflower that seems to be flowering very abundantly on the landscape. There's also some annual flowers that are very abundant on the landscape, but some of the other plants have not yet started. Um, <clears throat> so you're seeing variations between the species and their behavior at the landscape scale. So this was my question really was, how does this moisture gradient affect the, the perennial phenology? I mostly looked at perennial plants. I did look at annuals too, but they behave so similarly that I could almost clump them all into one species. Annual plants in general will germinate after rainfall, have that sort of canalized development through and end. 
Now, there are some exceptions with some, some invasive species in particular and a few other things that do things differently, but as a gross generalization, it, annuals were kind of lumped. So this looks mostly at perennial plants. This is um, a rainfall map, mean annual rainfall. And all I really want you to see here is that the, from the blue to the yellow is a very steep drop in rainfall. And if you look at the white dots, they just give you basic um, data on mean annual temperatures. You'll see there's almost no difference in temperature. So this is mean annual winter temperature and mean annual summer temperature. <clears throat> They're within one or two degrees of each other all the way down. So this is very much a moisture gradient, not a temperature gradient, okay? The sampling, I don't wanna go into too much detail, but these one kilometer squares, it, it's a crude, it, it has to be kind of crude because we're working on such a large scale, um, but we're looking at early flowering, mid flower to late flower as a sort of a three point scale. And then also one individual or less than 10% of the plants in flower, 10 to 75% of the plants in flower, more than 75% of the plants in flower. And on this scale, the highest value is for more than 75% of all the plants in full flower. And so it's just an ordinal scale one to three to give some sense of how extreme the bloom is for each species. So what is going on with temperature and day length versus moisture in our flora? Well, I'll give, I'll give you a short answer. Most plants in our flora have a very plastic response to water in terms of their phenology from leafing to flowering and fruiting. In particular, you see this in our chaparral, when a tropical storm hits, our chaparral will flower in summer if there's a tropical storm. If we get off season rains, most of the chaparral shrubs will go into full bloom. They're not waiting for a certain temperature or a certain day length. They're not really interested in winter. It's all moisture driven. So there's good examples there from the chaparral. The coastal sage too, so it's really high plasticity in general. And a lot of this is documented in the literature and, and previously known, but the leafing out of our drought deciduous shrubs is almost entirely correlated with moisture availability. First rains, leaves out. You guys have seen this and you know this somewhat intuitively, but if you read the literature, most of it comes from Europe and Northern areas and temperate climes. Most of the literature will tell you that phenology depends on temperature and day length because in other parts of the world, Phenology depends on temperature and day length. And there's actually very little published on our arid lands flora and our Mediterranean flora and its response to moisture. And moisture being the overriding driver of everything phenological. So as much as this, this is not brain science and it's probably very intuitive for most of you um, that you know rains drive the flowering, that wasn't in the literature, that wasn't well documented and, and still, still isn't well studied in all honesty, which is, it might sound surprising. Our annual plants, as we mentioned, have extremely high plasticity. They, again, are responding almost completely to moisture. But then we do have some species that are doing some very different things. So bulbs and geophytes, anything like onions, thing, um, our blue dicks, things that have bulbs under the soil, very different phenological patterns. Definitely not as straightforward. The other thing is cacti. And a lot of the species that have access to moisture that store their own moisture, they're succulent, they're able to control their flowering in very different ways. A lot of our cacti is still summer blooming. At one point that was thought to be um, the evolutionary pressure towards timing to coincide with the migration of hummingbirds and things and certain species in the desert. that a lot of cacti um, bloom in summer, maybe for the bats. And even if you take them into a Mediterranean climate, they will still bloom in summer rather than the spring. And so there certainly are plenty of exceptions to these rules but very general patterns, most of our flora responds to moisture. So what happens across that moisture gradient? Well, I'm just gonna give you the short answers of the study in the interest of time. But there are two really important moisture gradients. One is that rainfall from north to south, but the other is that fog from, from the coast inland, from west to east. The presence of those coastal fogs has a massive impact on our flowering times and our phenology. So to give you the, you know, the synopsis here, along the coast, where it's foggy, there is much less synchronicity of the bloom. The plants are blooming much more sporadically, but for a lot longer. The onset is earlier, the synchronicity is lower, but the duration is longer. And when you come inland, it's kind of obvious, it's hotter, it's drier, 
that bloom becomes a lot more pulsed. It becomes a lot more synchronous. So the rain falls, it starts drying up very quickly. There's no fog and cloud to keep the moisture in the soil. Everything starts drying up very fast. You get a very short, slightly late, well, it could even, uh, it's slightly later in general because it can't start before there's a major rainfall pulse. But once you get the major rainfall fall pulse, you will have a very synchronous short bloom. So that's like the very short lived super bloom. That's the big pulse, everyone at once. We've only got three weeks, <laughs> it's rain. <laughs> We're gonna have some flowers. And so you've got two very, very different ecological processes often within the same species. So along the coast, we might see our California sunflowers. Oh, they're flowering on and off. You know, 10% of the plants are in flower, 50% of the plants are in flower, but they started in February and they keep going till about June. Whereas inland, pretty much zero flowering until suddenly we're over 75% flowering for a short burst of time. So that's having a big effect on the distance the pollen's moving, but also the duration of time that they're available to pollinators. So um, a lot of our current thinking assumes that the same things that trigger the plants to flower also trigger the insects to emerge and that their triggers are correlated. And so a lot of the times we're seeing when the flowers come, the insects come. And they, we haven't seen a lot of the massive um, mismatches with the flowers being there without the insects and the insects being there without the flowers that we maybe predicted early on in ecology. In general, there's been a lot of generalized insects and pollinator syndromes that have been able to sort of bridge that gap. But what we are seeing now is you're much more susceptible to predation and you're much less likely to transfer your genes any distance. And your window of opportunity to make flowers and fruits is a lot smaller. Now I'll just go to the next slide. So this is an example of agave. Um, this is a sister species to agave shoya, um, which grows at uh, Cabrillo National Monument. This is agave sebastiana, which is a very closely related species restricted to the islands in Baja California. And you can see here it's growing in very foggy conditions. And so fog's kind of playing a dual role here because although that fog will keep that plant moist and that soil moist and extend that flowering time significantly. So these flowers are open for longer. On a really foggy day, insects won't fly. Their wings will be wet. The ag there's actually a reduction <laughs> in floral visitors and predators due to the presence of that fog. So the, fo <laughs> the fog is kind of working in both directions here, but the overarching pattern is the extension of the duration and this is the slowing down of the flowering. So the much less synchronous flowering. Although a very heavy fog day can be very um, detrimental in terms of floral visitors, certainly. Um, so I wanted to go over just a, some of the results from that study. Um, are we okay to keep going, Sam? Do we need to stop? Okay. So we've um, got about um, 10 minutes left or so. So if you want to you know, kind of wrap up your thoughts here in about five to seven minutes, we do have a couple questions for you at the end, if that makes sense. Okay, we might be able to extend great. a little bit longer if people come up with a bunch more questions, if, if you can stay, Sula. Okay, yeah, I'm happy to stay. Um, okay. And I'll, I'll try and get through this quickly. I think I've given you the background now, so hopefully I can just sort of show you these examples quickly. Perfect. So, you know, the overarching results of the study also showed there were really three types of plants in our flora. The first ones are those that still actually are responding to day length. And temp um, day length in particular, they flower on very specific dates of the year. And they do the same thing every year, regardless of weather. We have a second group that's the water responders, which frankly is most of the plants that we just talked about. And a third group that don't actually show much seasonality. I wanna just show you some of these examples, especially for those of you that know your plants and that some of these will be familiar to you. So this is that group of species that seem to respond to day length. Most of them are in the sunflower family. And you'll see very quickly, most of them do not have particularly stunning flowers. They seem to have a very, what we call a very general pollinator syndrome. They're attracting any insect. They have a very simple flower. They put out a very simple and specialized flower and they uh, attract a general kind of insect. So this almost seems to be a phylogenetic restriction where this one group of plants in the sunflower family in particular stayed um, uh, tuned into day length as their main trigger. Um, I'll give you just a, I'll show you a table quickly. And again, if, if this is just all Latin to you, that's fine. Um, you don't really need to, to read this table. I put up the common names on the left here in green. 
um, and the Latin names in the middle. But what I want you to see here is if you look on the, the two columns on the right hand side, the pollination syndrome includes wind a lot of the time. And if you look at the fruit type, they're almost all wind dispersed. And so this is thought to be an evolutionary adaptation to produce your fruits at the windiest time of the year. So by correlating your timing to day length, you correlate your fruit dispersal to the windiest time of the year. Hence, while I was mentioning the dispersal factors as well as the pollination factors, you've got two priorities. One is to be pollinated, the other is to disperse your seeds. If you're wind dispersed, you need to make those seeds at the windiest time of the year maybe really doesn't suit you to be weather dependent and water dependent in terms of when you produce your flowers because it might mess up your timing for windiness. So there's a very strong correlation here with these plants that correlate to day length with being wind dispersed. And so that's just to show you that general pollination syndrome up close there, very simple flowers, very symmetrical, very radially symmetrical, not a lot to them. The second group of plants is most of the plants we've talked about these, most plants, respond to water. And you see there's a huge number in this table. This is just to give you some idea. Almost all the fruits now are dry grains. They're mostly dispersed by granivores or any animals that eat grains. They're mostly dispersed by animals. They're mostly eaten. They're mostly dry fruits that drop. And almost every single plant in this group is vector pollinated. So you can see instantly that correlation here. This group, they respond to the moisture. They attract the insects that also come out with the moisture and then they produce dry seeds that they drop. And that affects a whole other trophic level. And I'll get to that in a second. The third group is probably a false group, but there are several species that don't show much seasonality. In some cases, that's because each plant is, is responding to very localized conditions. There's moisture in this little patch of soil, therefore I flower. And I, I don't really worry about what anyone else is doing. Some of these species also just flower almost year round. They'll just keep going and going. What's interesting here is it includes our laurel sumac and our lemonade berry. So some of our most dominant landscape plants, but if you think about it, you can find them in flower almost all year round. They might have a peak bloom, but they don't have that same seasonal window and synchronicity that other species do. And that's just to show you a few of those examples too. Um, again, I didn't mean to get bogged down in the details, but hopefully for some of you, this is like, oh, these plants in my garden. <laughs> Again, these are all vector pollinated too, but they tend to have much larger fleshy fruits. Okay, so climate change considerations, um, given this, hopefully our California current will stay cold. The big thing is if we lose our current and we lose our fog, it's gonna be a big problem. But as long as we have fog, our coastal regions are much more likely to harbor plants that flower for longer and have further transfer of genes. Therefore, our coastal lands are enormously important for plant conservation. And so I think this underscores, honestly, is, is almost a nice stopping point, um, underscores the importance of reserves like Cabrillo um, for, for protection of coastal species, that anywhere foggy, anywhere along the coast that allows our plants to flower for longer, to have a better chance to interact with their pollinators, to have those genes travel greater distances, is, they're gonna be a lot less fragile and a lot less susceptible to climate change. So that's, that's, you know, the main takeaway really when we think about sort of pulsing and synchronicity and pollination in our landscapes. Um, I'm just going to mention really quickly, the only other thing to consider is that's all very well with the flowering, but that production of seeds also affects a ton of things in the ecosystem. And so similarly, inland, you've got a very pulsed delivery of seeds. You've got highly synchronous flowering and therefore almost always highly synchronous production of seed. So there's one time of the year where, where food is very ample for birds and other animals, and, and the rest of the year there's a lot less available. And again, our coastal lands are gonna have this sort of constant slower supply, but because there's food available earlier and longer, birds can do a lot more. And just a really quick example of this is our um, California quail which in Baja California, I actually surveyed around these weather stations and these same phenological plots to compare what they were eating. And one of the things we noticed is that they were clutching up to three times at the coast when they were clutching just once inland. So presumably, you know, I think very reasonably related to these phytoestrogens, estrogens in the plants and their diet selection and the availability of these different foods. Inland, you've got one short season to nest, to reproduce, to find food, to eat your greens, to get it all done. On the coast, you can do three whole clutches. 
because the plants are green and flowering that much longer. And so there's just a very important trophic cascade from these pollinators all the way up to, to all the animals and the wildlife in our gardens. And I think Sam, if we're low on time, I might just stop there. Is that, is that a good stopping point? But um, if you have more questions. That's a great stopping point, uh, Sula. And we do have a, a few more questions here. Um, so first of all, Christina would like to know, is your paper available anywhere? And oh. you're, you're published, Sula, so maybe you can give some locations of where they can find your published works. Oh, certainly. They're all, all anything I've published is freely available on Google Scholar as a free downloadable PDF. So if you go to Google Scholar and search my name, um, you can find this, this paper in particular that I'm referencing um, is on, yeah, phenology. And I think it's called Rain and Fog, <laughs> like what matters for phenology or something like that. But yeah. Is, is available freely online. That's awesome. I love Google Scholar. Uh, for those of you, I know we have a lot of scientists here in our audience, but um, for those of you unfamiliar with Google Scholar, it's not the same as the Google search engine. So you can actually just go to, you can just Google Google Scholar and it'll come up with the address and you click on that. And this is where you can find all your peer reviewed uh, journals, right, on Google Scholar. So you just, once you're on Google Scholar, you can type in Sula's name and then all her work should come up there for you to peruse. Um, and I love that it's free and available for everyone. So that's fantastic. Um, so we've got another question from anonymous attendee. Uh, <laughs> does, does synchronicity effects occur in grapes grown near the California coast? Because that would be a problem for harvest, right? Ooh, do you know much about grapes? Oh, it's a great, it's a great question. And I think I think obviously these same processes are going to affect, you know, everything from crop plants to, to everything else. But I think foggy regions are often very popular for wine in particular, you know, foggy valleys. I think there's long, there's long been an association with vinters and foggy regions. So I would say yes, but you're outside my knowledge base. <laughs> <laughs> Another uh, question for Google or Google Scholar, I think. <laughs> um, okay, so... I do have a question that I think was related to a slide way back. So hopefully we can kind of parse it out here. Um, anonymous attendee, maybe you want to rephrase your question. Uh, it says, is this the only location that contains C3, C4, and here comes another word that I'm gonna mispronounce, prosoliacian metabolism. Did I do okay with that one? <laughs> yeah, no, I, I understood the, the C3, C4, the, the CAM, we call it CAM for short. So there's three different types of photosynthesis. What was, what was the beginning of the question? Is this the only location that continues? Oh, I think this is referring to the habitat slide where I was talking about having drought deciduous plants, evergreen plants. Um, almost all cacti and succulents have that Crashulacean acid metabolism, which is the ability to use those storage cells in the succulent tissues to separate um, different processes of photosynthesis. So you can make your food without losing your water during the day and then breathe at night. So you don't lose as much water. It, yeah, it's, it's different ways of coping um, with photosynthesis and, and respiration. Um, no, it's certainly not the only place, um, but it is a, a beautiful mix of different conditions. Cool. Thank you for helping me parse that out. <laughs> wasn't sure what it was referring to. It's a cool question. <laughs> yeah, and then someone, uh, I think the same person, C3, C4, and CAM metabolism, I think we're trying to clarify there. All right, excellent. Um, and I have a question for you, Sula. So you touched on why it's important to have um, locations of conservation, right, for these coastal plants. Um, and is there, are there ways that people can get involved in conservation efforts for these important coastal plant communities um, that you can think of maybe certain organizations or um, projects or things that people can do to help conservation efforts, people like you? Yeah. You know, it's a great question. The answer is always yes. <laughs> um, but one, one resource I would point you to, um, and, and I'm sorry, I could have gone on all night. This is a trouble. You guys get me talking about my favorite subjects. But one resource I would point you to is the, the Climate Science Alliance put out a San Diego uh, County Ecosystems Report. 
and and there's a there's a you know, we did a chapter on fog in there too but at the end of each chapter there's a list of things that you can do at home and how you can perhaps incorporate fog into your thinking your gardening your restoration efforts what you're doing um and different things to uh, related to climate so i would say that's a great place to start if you're sort of thinking about it in a very serious way but I would also turn the question back to you, Sam, as somebody that works in a coastal reserve, are there opportunities where people can help? There certainly are in Baja California. Um, in Baja California, we're, we're always desperate for help to conserve coastal lands. And there's several nonprofits like the one I work for, Pernatura Norweste. We work hard to conserve habitat corridors, coastal lands, chaparral, coastal sage scrub. Um, we own large reserves on the southern side of Tecate Mountain. Um, also down all around the peninsula and uh, yeah helps needed everywhere right need everyone yes does does your organization um accept volunteers to come help with this sort of, sort of restoration work at the moment with covid we we're not doing anything our offices are actually still closed but um longer term we could certainly make something like that happen Wonderful. Yeah, I mean, that's something that I always recommend. So you turned it back to me. Of course, national parks have a huge volunteer force, uh, volunteers and parks. Um, and that's something that if you live in San Diego or are interested in volunteering, you could always volunteer with Cabrillo National Monument on many different projects that help us to preserve and protect. Um, but yeah, there's many wonderful organizations out there that you can uh, volunteer with. Um, well, Sula, I think that's about it. I'm just going to quickly share my screen here again. Bear with me, folks, if you don't mind. Um, so this wonderful talk was part of Cabrillo's Pollinator Palooza, which sadly is now coming to an end. It was a six month celebration of all things plants and pollinator. But as you see on your screen, Pollinator Palooza might be over, but there's still more fun to come. Uh, so we have some really interesting and exciting discoveries that have been happening at the Rio National Monument um, that we're going to be doing uh, some breaking news on about a rare bee species in particular. Um, we also have a recording of this talk, as well as all the other talks in this series, up and available for you to peruse at your leisure. Um, and there's going to be some more visitor center exhibits, like a plein air exhibit with our native plants, where we um, enlisted the help of a bunch of local artists to paint um, our, some of our incredible plants at Cabrillo. So be looking for that in the future. And of course, as always, I'd like to thank Cabrillo National Monument Foundation for sponsoring this event. Um, and I'd like to thank you for coming tonight uh, and taking part in Pollinator Palooza. And of course, most of all, to thank Dr. Sula Vanderplank for her knowledge tonight. Um, Sula, we just really appreciate the important conservation work you're doing and taking some time tonight to speak to us about that was, was really the highlight of my week. So thank you all. And I hope you have a wonderful night. Thank you, Sam. Bye everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you all for being there. And I'll just read some of these comments in case you can't see them in the chat while people are logging off. It says, well run presentation, fascinating topic and enthusiastic engaging presenter. Well Thank worth you. my time. Thank you. Thank you, John. Oh, we had someone that had a spider crab question. Uh, oh, Elizabeth Skinner says there is a new David Attenborough series, series called Life in Color that talks about how they get their color, the spider crabs. Awesome. Obviously, that has been my Netflix queue. And I'm fantastic. I, yes, no, I, guess, I guess I better watch that episode here pretty soon. Um, Yvonne says, thank you. That was a great presentation. Lots of thanks, Sula. So, again, thank you very much. Um, and I am going to end this presentation now, <laughs> Sula, unless you have any final thoughts. No, thank you so much for having me. It's always a pleasure and great to see you. It was a delight. I'll see you again soon, I hope. Cheers. Bye, everyone. Thank you.